contact our secretariat. Please contact our secretariat to have your CPT information forwarded to you should you wish to claim those points for your individual professional organizations. Bit of housekeeping. Uh, please note that these sessions are run as follows. We will introduce our presenter who will present for us between 30 and 40 minutes. We then will have an open session to the general audience to answer questions and interact with our guests. This is done either by raising your hand, at which time the moderator will acknowledge you and invite you to ask your question. Alternatively, you can post your question in the chat and the moderator will ask the question on your behalf. We ask that you please mute your electronic device unless you are asking a question. So we have a very interesting speaker tonight. Um, our speaker for tonight is going to be engineer James Clark, and he's going to be speaking on a, uh, speaking to us on quite an exciting topic. Uh, just give me a sec here. James, as you know, has a wide and varied career, and I am going to basically be giving you his bio just in a second. But I wanted to give you an update before we get into our this, our lecture this evening as to some events that we have coming up. As some of you are aware, those who are members of the Barbados Association of Professional Engineers, we will be celebrating our 60th anniversary starting on the 29th of September. And we're going to be doing that. That starts a kicks off rather a week of activities for us. On the 29th, we're going to be having a church service, and that's going to be at the St. George Parish Church, and that's going to be an 8 a.m. start. So we would ask uh, for those of you who would like to join us, we look forward to seeing you on Sunday morning at St. George Parish Church. The next event will be a webinar, which will be on Tuesday, October 2nd. And we're going to have engineering fellow Andrew Hutchinson going to walk us down memory lane, as it were, over the last 60 years. And uh, we hope that we can get members turning out to that webinar to listen and learn about our association, but also to engage Andrew on um, being part of the association over that period of time, as well as our other fellows and members who would be in attendance. On October 2nd, we are going to have a tour and a member's line. So the tour is going to be at 3 p.m. Wednesday, 2nd of October, as I said there, where we're going to tour the Barbados Light and Power St. Lucie facility. And we welcome all to this insightful event with our sole electricity provider. And then we're asking you to join us afterwards for our member's line. Uh, and that's going to be on the uh, a small establishment on the West Coast. And we will have some more information for you um, before the evening is over as to the exact establishment we are looking to visit. But uh, we would ask that you come out and really affiliate yourself, uh, not only with your members and your friends and your colleagues, but also to see this um, wonderful project that is up in the north of the country. And then we round off the week of activities with our 60th anniversary dinner and awards ceremony. That's being held at the Wyndham Grand Resort, Sam Lars Castle. And that's going to be on the Saturday evening. And the we have specially invited guests, our patron for the evening, Her Excellency, the Most Honorable Dame Sandra Mason. Um, she will be in attendance as our patron for that evening. And we will have our as our guest speaker, um, Sir Patterson Cheltenham, former Chief, Chief Justice of Barbados. So we're looking forward to an exciting address and we're looking forward to good company and friendship and fellowship on that evening. Uh, tickets are priced at $250. If you're coming with a spouse, which we hope you are, um, there is a discounted rate for that. There's also um, a price for tables, which uh, you can contact the secretariat and they'll be able to give you further details. But we would want you to support us in this, our 60th anniversary dinner. And at that um, event, you will then get to see who this year has been recognized as our fellows and which project has captured the engineering project of the year. So we're looking forward to a really exciting week next week, starting on Sunday, working our way through to Sun um working our way through to Saturday, sorry. And uh, we are looking forward to your support and for you to join us in the activities that will be coming up 
during the given week. So um, let us move on to the business of this evening's event. Our speaker, um, Engineer James Clark, serves as the president of the Barbados Chamber of Com Commerce and Industry, the BCCI, which helps local business prosper and grow um, by facilitating a more enabling business environment in Barbados and the CARICOM single market. BCCI's areas of focus include assisting members make linkages in new offshore markets, business resilience and sustainability, climate change initiatives and projects, and cost of living issues. James is an executive director and electrical power systems engineer with experience in engineering company operations. His interests are business process improvement, electrical power generation and distribution, power quality, power systems efficiency and reliability, maintenance and repair operations, energy efficiency, and green building science. James has a master's of business administration from the University of Surrey, Guildford, UK, and a bachelor of engineering science electrical from Western University, London, Ontario, Canada. James is a registered professional engineer in Barbados and is certified power quality professional. This evening, James will be speaking to us on the topic of the responsibility of a technical professional to the corporate landscape of Barbados. So James, I would ask now that you um, turn on your camera and you can begin your presentation as soon as you're ready, sir. Welcome. Okay, thank you very much, Vincent. And thank you very much to the BAP for allowing me to speak to you this evening. Um, this is an interesting topic and I really hope that everybody will find this uh, uh, interesting, inspiring, um, and certainly I look forward to your comments and questions afterwards. So I will get straight into it and share my screen here. Share. Show. Okay. Is everybody seeing it okay? See these. Vincent? Was, yes, we are yes, good. We're good, James. We're good? Okay. All right. So the topic of tonight's conversation, responsibility of the technical professional to the corporate landscape of Barbados. So by way of agenda, this will we'll go through a short introduction, a discussion on technical professionals, corporate landscape, responsibilities, adding value, and the future. So by way of introduction, you may be wondering at this stage, what, what is our responsibility to corporate landscape? Certainly we work in businesses, we work for businesses, we may have our own businesses. And where is the interface between the technical professionals and those businesses? So just by way, you know, we're engineers, we like our definition. So engineers, we not to hopefully have not left anybody out but you will see them there on the slide. And actually when I was creating this list, I was I was like, wow, there, there certainly are a lot of different uh, facets and this may not even encompass all. Mechanical, civil, structural, electrical, electronic, industrial systems, chemical, environmental and sustainability, software, automation, control, biomedical, materials, mechatronic, robotics, marine, coastal, transportation, building service, aeronautical, geological, and the list goes on and on. And certainly for the architects who may be on this evening, many different areas as well, residential, commercial, landscape, urban design and planning, restoration, conservation. In terms of the corporate landscape, it's global, it's local, it's global. There's small businesses, there's micro, small, medium, large. You could work in your town, in your district, in your island, in your country state and and it and beyond throughout the whole world but the thing is about the corporate landscape is that i would say nearly all if not all 
rely on infrastructure to conduct their operations. And as technical professionals, we certainly underpin the entire corporate landscape by creating this infrastructure and enabling an environment and an enabling environment for businesses to develop and operate and grow. For example, I think you could say that nowadays you need nearly every single business needs some form of electricity to operate. So what are our responsibilities as technical professionals? You'll see first on the list is high ethical standards. No one is going to take us seriously, nor should we be taken seriously without promoting and engaging and projecting the highest ethical standards of integrity and trustworthiness and transparency. The last thing you want to do when you're guiding somebody or somebody's business or something is for somebody to actually question your integrity or have them feel that you're just trying to sell them something. It's, this is something that is really, really important and I hope uh, forms part of everybody's uh, CPD requirements, making sure that these are being followed. That's the way to build that connection with the business community by being known. So I'm going to put in a shameless plug for the chamber here. The chamber is known as the trusted advisor to the business community. The same way technical professionals need to be trusted advisors to the business community. We are also there in a different role. Following on from that, of course, is continuing professional development and, like, and a commitment to lifelong learning. That way, you certainly stay abreast of all the different, um, whatever changes are happening in the world in your particular field, um, or maybe not in your field, or maybe in a field that you thought was distant from yours that is now impacting your field. This allows you to demonstrate technical leadership within your, amongst your peers and also to your clients. The development and, and learning helps you be innovative by staying abreast of anything that is going on in the world. And we can say certainly within our chosen discipline, but I think you will have figured out by now and have realized by now in your work that it's a global discipline. And so innovations come from all over the world. And with the access to information that's available nowadays and the software tools and so on that we have, uh, it's it's incredible the, the pace at which uh, innovation is occurring. And it's something that we certainly, I know certainly for myself, there are times when I feel like I'm really, <laughs> really, really, uh, it moves so much faster than when I first started in my career. So you really have to stay on top of it and be very open-minded to what's coming down the pipe and also be very willing to let go of former mean ways of doing things, whether that is technical or business or in, in just general interactions with people. It also allows demonstrates your commitment to quality, quality work, quality projects, quality designs, and Coupled with that, as I said, you know, we're not, only, not only are we in a rapidly changing technical environment, we're in a rapidly changing global socioeconomic political environment, as well as physical environment. And we must demonstrate adaptability in whatever we do. Because that is, you know, as, as the saying goes, the only, the only uh, changes, the only thing constant about change is there's more changes is happening. It just seems to be happening more and more rapidly. We must be adaptable as technical professionals. Business has to be adaptable, otherwise they're going to go to business quickly. We have to be there making sure that we provide that same level of service or better. And then, of course, at some point in time, I'm sure we all want to retire, whatever that may look like. So there's mentorship opportunities for younger people, technical professionals coming along, where you can pass on your benefit of your uh, knowledge and experience in your field uh, to the next generation coming along who are going to take up the mantle and run with it, knowing full well that during the course of their career, they may come across things that we never even dreamed of, but we can give them the best possible um, foundation to make that springboard. Of course, effective collaboration and communication with the business community is critical 
because at the end of the day, we're going to be marrying technical solutions and business objectives. So you're going to be saying, how or what, how is what I need to do this? And I need an engineer or I need an architect to do this for me. But if you don't fully understand the ramifications of what you're doing and how the what the impact is, or be there to provide the benefit of your experience, because the business may think it needs to do build widgets five inches square, and you know that coming down the pipes, that's just not going to be practical because of the following reasons. And it is part of the technical professional's uh, job and remit to uh, guide, have these two-way discussions with the business community as to which is the best way to proceed because you're looking down the road as well. They are too, and they're looking from a business point of view. You're looking down the road, understanding their business, but also understanding where you where you can best apply what it is that they are hoping to achieve. Of course, we also have, as I said before, we're living in a very changing world. So risk identification, analysis, and mitigation is a key support service that you can provide to businesses. Okay, they see business risk and certain things, but they may not see the technical risks or climate risks or other global risks that could, you know, cybersecurity, all these other things. And as, as technical professionals, we understand all of these various aspects. We need to understand how they impact someone's particular business or business sector or manufacturing facility. Uh, so, for example, I'll give an example, say the Internet of Things, uh, different components in a manufacturing facility built by different companies that may be connected to a network, may have varying degrees of, of, of protection built into them or not. And sometimes, and it's been proven in the past and been shown to happen, it, that people have been able to hack into specific devices and actually gain access to networks and can cause havoc with a company. So these, this is a really, really key part of what the technical professionals uh, do. Certainly that's from an electrical point of view. You can say the same thing for buildings and uh, seismic uh, issues, climate change, uh, natural hazards, these sorts of things. So there, there's a whole gamut of risks that surround uh, business and the world that we live in. And businesses, so you may hear this regularly, some of the companies you may work for may actually have corporate, uh, engage in ESG or corporate social responsibility. So environmental, social and governance objectives is, as far as I know, going to be part of the IFRS uh, accounting standards and businesses are looking to make sure that they com are compliant and that they can gain the necessary uh, compliance and, and um, benefits of having uh, addressed how their business impacts the environment uh, socially as well as governance. We spoke initially about high ethical standards. This is where your governance hits your road with the business community. Okay, so this is a very, very key. And this governance stretches not just within your organization or with the company you're dealing with, but this can go, for example, all the way back up a supply chain. So you may think that you're supplying X material for a job. It could be any material of any sort. And then where is that coming from? How is that getting here? Where, is, where did it come from before then? Where did your raw materials come from? And what are the labor practices? What are the uh, what governance do to the companies back up the supply chain? How do they hold themselves to high ethical standards, and so on? So we have to be very, very aware of these things, and it's becoming more and more prominent. Of course, we spoke before about risk identification, security, data protection, protection of intellectual property as well. I think that is. That is key nowadays, considering most things run on a computer. We've seen what happens when they get a major uh, issue, especially for global networks, what can happen. And uh, this is a very key area. And last but not least, of course, the regulatory environment, making sure that we are compliant with laws and standards and up to date with the codes. Uh, because again, somebody may have in their mind, yes, I wish to do it this way, 
but you know that it's not to code. And it doesn't matter if they want it done that way because it's that's expensive or can't see the need for it. But it's our duty to explain, you know, to be compliant, you must adhere to these codes. And this is a point at which now I really would like to see the Barbados Building Code fully enacted and fully uh, required in the building uh, uh, for buildings throughout the country. I think it would make a big difference uh, to their to our built infrastructure and making sure that we can withstand or, or make it more resilient to withstand the natural hazards that we face. So when we add value as a technical professional, so you spoke about the things that we're aware of, we're using our technical skills and experience to solve real world problems and find innovative solutions that helps businesses do the following things. Of course, businesses really want to improve their competitiveness. If they're not competitive, they tend not to stick around that, that much. And that usually requires efficiency improvements and also some level of measure or level of scalability for economies of scale. We need to improve, help them improve their security, whether that is physical security, data security, IP security, uh, equipment security, all of those things. Resiliency, sustainability. So resiliency against the impacts of, uh, so, energy uh, and other infrastructure. Uh, again, your buildings, uh, power, water, uh, transportation, supply chains, and so on, making sure that, that is, there's enough redundancy in there that the business can survive various internal and external shocks. Sustainability, of course, you can't be operating unsustainably and expect to stay in business for a very long time because even though it may seem that you're doing well, once people get aware of what you're doing, they may be less interested in doing business with you if they realize that you're not pursuing sustainable practices. Lessening energy consumption and environmental impact. I mean, energy consumption certainly is increasing. It is not going down yet, even as things become more efficient, there still is a, a real demand for consumption. Um, recently in the news, you would see that Microsoft is having one of the Three Mile Island uh, nuclear reactors recommissioned so that they can purchase power from them for the next 20 years. That is the extent of the electricity that they need and the stability that they need, that they're willing to make that investment. We also need to help business mitigate the impact of climate change. And we spoke about this as well, resilience to natural, natu natural hazards. Provide welcoming, safe, and aesthetically pleasing spaces to work in. Effectively use available resources. Reduce your carbon footprint. And mitigate or eliminate any adverse impact of their operations. So we may have to advise them things that are, again, affecting the environment or people or the end users or customers, anything that, or even the land <clears throat> that they're operating on, need to advise them, how can you change this so there's minimal or no impact on any of these areas. And also provide an environment that encourages diversity and inclusion, and lifelong learning, mentoring, and knowledge transfer. So you can see from these things, we're really a very key business partner to the community. Even though they may not have us on staff all the time or may come to us periodically, we can assist in all of these different ways. So it may give you some ideas as when you approach the business community, other ways in which we can provide uh, real value to them uh, and to their businesses. So where are we going from here? Now, this slide here is not meant to be... Uh, 
in any way negative, but it is the world in which we live in. So where are we looking in the near, medium-term future, or even the long-term future? Climate change is one of the top of the list. The increasing unpredictability, intensity, and frequency of natural hazards is a serious problem. We see it with hurricanes, how many they are, how quickly they spin up or, or intensify, and they go all over the place. This hurricane season has been rather strange where they start where they go some of them starting in the western caribbean and going up um it, it's it's quite incredible but what is very clear is that if we do not address the resiliency of our of our water sources our energy sources our general built infrastructure and food security we could be in serious trouble with the impacts of climate change um, we've seen, like in recently with Beryl, we've seen uh, coastal uh, structures take a beating that was not envisaged probably when they were built and requiring them needing to be upgraded, changed, so that they can handle the increased power of these natural hazards. And this is something, there are opportunities there uh, for engineers and architects right through any of those areas. Unfortunately, climate change also has an impact on biodiversity and habitat destruction, sometimes for farming or, or buildings, houses, and so on. Pollution, uh, whether that be air pollution, plastic pollution. I think you're seeing a lot of focus on plastic pollution now in the ocean especially, and realizing that plastic doesn't exactly break down into molecules, it just breaks down into smaller and smaller pieces, and it's starting to turn up in the food chain. And this is a serious, serious problem. And climate change, of course. And the issue of, with this here is that it disrupts entire ecosystems, and therefore you may not have, things may not grow as well as they used to, or where they used to. Um, natural resources that we rely on, for example, uh, wood, uh, may not be available in the same way or in the same places that it used to be available uh, or in the same quantity. So we have to constantly think about these things and look at what we're doing as 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 humans and realize, you know, where can we apply our knowledge and technical expertise to halt or reverse these things or provide alternate solutions that will limit the loss of biodiversity in our world. Next up, of course, is mass migration due to armed conflict, persecution, poor economic and working conditions, adverse environmental conditions, often aggravated by climate change. And this leads to resource pressures, food and energy, land, social upheaval. So this is a social part of what we're doing. So we do play a role in making sure that our economies work as best as they can, that are good working conditions, that we do not contribute to climate change, leading to adverse environmental conditions. You will note, of course, that our Prime Minister often speaks about this at the UN, about the impact of global warming, often by larger, much larger countries, and we feel it here as small island developing states. So this is a serious, serious thing. Health and wellness. Well, we've been through the A pandemic and there's always a risk of more. Drug resistant microbes, new diseases, lack of access to healthcare. How can we as technical professionals turn this around? Again, apply our knowledge into the health and wellness field. The incidence of NCDs in Barbados is shocking. And the cost to our healthcare system is also shocking. Um, the NCD Commission will be providing more information and so on on this during this month of September. Um, but it also provides opportunities for research and development into medica different medications, uh, how the microbes and viruses, how they replicate, uh, what can we do to mitigate against them? How can we ensure the health and wellness of all of, of our global population so that we live the best lives that we can? 
and also how do we provide the access to healthcare. So in Barbados, we generally have, we have access public and private healthcare. There are some countries where it's just, it just doesn't happen or people have to travel great distances. How can we change? So one example you may have heard of is uh, in Rwanda, in Africa. Very mountainous, but they need medical equipment. So they use uh, and supplies, whether it's pharmaceuticals or blood or whatever, and they have uh, drones that they use that can fly these great distances and either land or drop them by parachute into areas and it allows them to get uh, the medications and so on that they need. So there, there are ways that access to healthcare doesn't just mean building a hospital or a clinic. It can mean how can we how can we assess uh, diseases, assess people's health well in advance before the actual disease or the symptoms show up? How can we get all their medication and other thing to them quickly, especially if we live somewhere in remote areas um, that doesn't have that easy access or requires refrigeration, which is not possible. So this is this is a big area. Uh, for us to think about. Of course, there's pervasive digital transformation and its effects on business and society. And digital transformation certainly has been shown to improve efficiency. It enables growth. Uh, we would certainly have all experienced automation and AI, and that's only set to grow. Broader connectivity across with people. So people now are connected in ways that they never were before or would have taken days or months or sometimes years to be connected with that amount of shared information. And also because of that, then you have a broader access to information. More people can have access to it, therefore can act on it, can use it. Regrettably, it's also a source for misinformation. And as we've seen as well, that that has can have a serious uh, deleterious effect on societies and social fabric of any society or country. And security is another one. So this digital transformation is not necessarily in its infancy, but I think certainly over the next 10, 20, 30 years, you're going to see massive, massive changes where this is concerned and ways which we may seem far-fetched now may well be just common. And again, the technical community has a key role to play in all of these things, bearing in mind, not just for profit or just because it can be done, but also bearing in mind the ethical side of digital transformation. And last but not least, of course, is energy. The use is increasing. And there's a definite need for more abundant carbon neutral or zero carbon sources. As we've seen, the contribution to climate change by the burning of fossil fuels is well documented. So Renewable energy, of course, has its place, as we've seen. Renewable energy, by its very nature, also is extremely vulnerable to our natural hazards. I was reading a report here from FM Global speaking about the renewable energy industry in some ways becoming uninsurable because of their vulnerability the wind, hurricanes, tornadoes, fires, flood, uh, equipment breakdowns, and so on. And what they've found in their business is that the losses outstrip the insurance coverage. And when that happens, then you have a problem where you have all these renewable energy plants. And if you cannot get adequate insurance and you're having these increasing uh, frequency of intense natural hazards, how can we as technical professionals up the ante with better equipment, better installations, more resilient installations that can survive these types of events? So this is another area where 
technical professional can certainly add their experience. And of course, zero carbon sources. As I mentioned earlier that Microsoft, you know, they're looking to re rekindle one of the reactors at Three Mile Island. As nuclear power goes, it certainly has a zero carbon. I know there are issues with it, but it's difficult to find a more stable base load uh, energy source, at least with the current technology that's available. And it's, I really hope that in years to come with increased interest and increased um, uh, research and development done into that field, that they can learn to manage it much better and it can provide that level of stability that we need going forward. So at this point, I would like to thank you very much for letting me have this, present this uh, topic to you. And I would like to open the floor then to any questions or comments or queries that anybody may have. Thank you. All right, thanks James so much for your presentation this evening. Um, certainly we looked at the responsibility of the technical um, professional and you mentioned things such as high ethical standards and continuous professional development. Um, and the and the interesting statement you made about willing to let go of former ways of doing things, which is uh, I think a penchant that um, should be put up somewhere in Barbados. Um, effective collaboration and communication was another one of those things that you mentioned. And then maybe we're talking about the adding value as a technical professional. You spoke about basically the challenges that confront our world, not only our country but our world today. And what role can we as technical professionals play? I think um, sometimes um, engineers especially are so busy with their calculations and head down doing the work that they don't look up and look around and realize that they have a greater role than just um, doing the work as it were, that there is need for our input in the boardroom and at higher levels so that um, when decisions are made that they are well thought out decisions and that there's an element of critical thinking that comes into play that sometimes our colleagues who are lawyers and accountants just don't seem to be able to get. So um, at this stage, I want to open, as James said, the, the floor to some questions. But James, I want to start until we can get some questions flowing. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, you, you are an engineer. You've come from an engineering background. Um, you have been involved in the management of the company you work for for some time. Uh, when, when you look around your the corporate landscape and the position that you currently sit in the, as BCCI uh, president, are you seeing a lot of technical persons beginning to get involved in in the in the in the um, business fabric of our country, or is it still slanted? Uh, more to one side or the next, and you're not really seeing the input of the technical professional thanks vincent um actually yes you are you are seeing more inroads being made by technical people and not just in technical roles so they have that problem solving background which works really well in business um we're engineers unfortunately and uh, can uh, fall down sometimes is in the communication and but this is something that can be learned and and it is learned and thankfully yes we are there and this is why our role is so important i mean this is one of the reasons why i also did a, a business certification because i realized that there is there is this marriage between the two and i think that we can really add value as technical professionals by understanding the business more not just, as you said, Vincent, just focusing on something small, this specific project, but trying to understand the whole, the much broader sector where somebody is operating and be able to say, you know what, hey, if you do this, this way or do it that way, um, you know, you can really make significant changes and whether that's improvements to people's well-being, um, increase the efficiency of their business, decrease the amount of losses that they make, for example, in manufacturing, um, or even just improve the general 
atmosphere of where they work or dealing with hazardous materials or anything of the sort. There's so many ways to add value to a business. And I would really encourage people, you know, to, to get more involved where that is concerned, just, just uh, yeah, even understanding. Um, but yeah, we are seeing more people come through and, and I think that's really good. And as the fields of engineering are expanding as I opened in one of my slides, as I said, you know, when I did engineering, it was civil, mechanical, electrical, uh, materials, and computer, maybe. Now that's been expanded into a whole set of subsections in different areas that anybody can go and specialize in. So yes, so to answer your question, yes, we are we are seeing that. Okay. Yeah. Now you would have mentioned I want to go back to that statement. We need to let go of formal ways of doing things. Mm -hmm. Where 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 did that statement come from, James? You want to expand a little bit on that? Well, lots of kicks in the backside. <laughs> you know, we like to do things a certain way. We are trained to do it a certain way. And you realize that, you know, sometimes they're much better ways of doing things or the way that we did it before is not really necessary um, or the, our time there may be a piece of software for example that can do what we would have spent hours and hours and hours doing which of course by no means we needed to do them and we need to understand how it works so the software doesn't teach you you still need to know what you're doing but you may have spent a whole week doing a whole bunch of calculations, which now can be done in a couple of hours, and that you just you use your knowledge and experience to vet the information that is provided. So, therefore, it then frees up your time to do other value-added activities. So this is what I mean. We got to be willing to embrace the changes, and also the technologies that are coming out. So certain things that we may have done a certain way before, just are not necessarily required, or maybe they're integral to the piece of equipment. Whereas before there used to be 10 different pieces, now it's two, but everything is now rolled into one. So we don't need to have all of this extra stuff in there. And um, so, yeah, that's, that's, that's why I said that because it, it really is, we really need to, to take stock of where we are, where we're going, what it's going to take to get there. And, how can we do it with the best efficiency to get the best outcomes? Sometimes that means radically changing the way that we look at things and how we do things. That segues nicely into the next area that I want to ask you about. You did mention the massive impact that the digital transformation will have across businesses, regardless of whatever industry it's going to be. Mm -hmm. um, can you perhaps, one, from a Barbadian perspective, tell us what type of major changes you see coming down the pipeline and two from a technical perspective um speaking to your fellow um technocrats as it were tell us a bit about um where do you see the, this digital transformation taking us in our various professions okay so big things coming down the pipes in terms of digital transformation in businesses and the idb and inter-american development Bank, they did a study about digital um, transformation in the Caribbean. And they found that nearly 80% of businesses are considered a threat and also an opportunity. And nearly the same number had digital transformation either in progress, in place, we're planning to do it. It is that significant an impact, okay? At the simplest level is things like, you know, we use computers now and, and email instead of fax machines. Um, but the way that we communicate is so much faster and you're finding that changing. What was considered years ago uh, could only be on a desktop uh, computer, you know, carry it in your pocket, right? So you have this level and it's, and you're connected almost everywhere you go. So you have this level of connectivity. And it's also then how people use it. You realize that there's a huge shift to doing things online, virtually. I mean, BAP sessions I've attended before, mostly in person. We're doing this all online, which is fine. Maybe it allows more people to participate. 
I'll give you an example from a business point of view, how digital transformation has been used uh, in the continent of Africa. There are about 55 or 56 countries in the African Union. The African uh, Import-Export Bank have a number of platforms that they use to bring all of those countries into a common platform to enable business to trade, not just within the continent, but globally. And those examples are, they have a system, it's like a due diligence platform. Everybody has their information on it. And you put in whatever you wish to buy. And it tells you who sells it, where they sell it, what quantities, what the tariff codes are, what it's going to take for you to import it from that country or export to that country, what the laws are and various regulations you need to be aware of. All this is on one platform, huh? And you can get it across all of these different countries. Then, when you want to pay for it, the bank allows you to pay in your currency. So you don't have to look for US or pounds or whatever it is that you uh, happen to use. You can pay in your own local currency and the bank does the, trans does the, the um, uh, conversion and pays the other person in theirs. They take care of that. They also... They also have, uh, for example, an escrow service that basically, if you want to pay, so it works kind of like PayPal, if you want to buy 10 generators from this country and this person, you have no idea who they are, but they have a good price and seem to have a good product. But you don't know whether if your money, that could just be a very good web page and a good talker. So they actually will make sure that you receive what you have paid for. So you don't, they hold the money, they receive the product, and the transaction happens via them. So this is an example of how business can be facilitated very, very quickly by using an online platform. And this is something that uh, they have actually said that Caribbean businesses, they want to see Caribbean businesses on the same platform so that they can facilitate trade then between the Caribbean and African countries so that we can, uh, and that, it can be done in a safe manner and with confidence. So that's one particular example uh, for business facilitation. Uh, but certainly, I think most of us now operate paperless offices wherever possible. Uh, COVID of source has helped uh, push that along. And I think we'll see more of it. Um, where that's going in the future, uh, we can only guess. Um, but I have seen our uh, research being done into, for example, people operating power stations and there's no physical uh, instrumentation in front of you. It's all holographic and you can see all of your information, all of your uh, switches, everything that you would normally interact with is actually just there in the air. So that then saves a whole bunch of wiring and other things. Of course, it has its issues as well. Um, the second part of your question, repeat that again there for me, please. I was asking in terms of the technical professional, uh, right. how should we prepare uh, for this digital transformation that is coming? Sure. So again, interacting with people and you may interact not just locally, but regionally or even globally. Uh, it allows you to provide all of your information, all of your presentations, all of your design work, um, your uh, the, the building information modeling. Okay, so all of that then can be shared easily. So, so let's just choose the building information modeling. How many projects have people worked on where there's puzzles during the project because this is too small. You haven't left enough room for this. Oh, we forgot about this now. How are we going to route it? through this space and, and this type of thing, when, from what I understand, when you do that amount of work and all the modeling, 3D modeling and everything done up front, it really, really, it takes a bit longer for you to start. But once you start, there's much less issues down the road. And of course, these devices exist not just for new buildings, but you can do them for existing buildings. You can go and put them in different rooms and just, and you can get a 3D plot of everything that's in there. So we need to embrace these technologies and realize that they, they certainly are real time savers. 
and they also save from a social point of view. There are less people arguing with one another. Right. So these are all ways that we can uh, that we can um, that we can use it as the, uh, it it enriches our communication between each other, okay. and that 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 has to be a good thing. All right, so I have three questions for you. I want yep. got one in the chat. Let me bring that up first, and then um, Trevor's got a question for you as well. So mm -hmm. let's start with the chat. Um, this, how do you view the use and implementation of ISO 9000 standards or similar standards for the systematic improvement of a company and or their employees? Okay, so the ISO series of standards, um, certainly what it does is it, a standard does what we expect it to do. It sets the benchmark for whichever industry you're in. This is equality standard or health and safety standard or environmental standard, whichever one you're using to ensure that everybody works. And once you qualify and you meet those targets, it gives people, not just the people who work there, the business owners, the shareholders, the stakeholders, the employees, the customers and so on, a certain standard. When you see something is made to a particular standard, you know, okay, fine. They have registered and met this ISO standard and it certainly gives you a measure of comfort for them to receive that certification that you know that what you are getting has been made to a certain standard in a certain way with certain methodologies that it doesn't guarantee that it's going to be what it says on a tin but it is a much better guarantee of doing that than someone that does not work to those standards. Okay, and this is anything from the ISO 9000, the quality standards, as I said, health and safety, uh, environmental uh, efficiency, all of those things. And, and they're critical. And again, if you, wanna, if you want to trade globally, not just buy and sell things, but your services, your design services, it really helps to have uh, been certified to these standards so people can say, you know what? okay, he's actually certified to this level. This is why we have uh, certifications and so on to make sure that we have a, a minimum standard and hopefully not just, and that people don't just adhere to the minimum. It gives you a measure of confidence and that somebody um, is who they say they are and that products and so on and services do what they say they do. So James, are you saying then to effectively compete in markets outside of Barbados that our companies really need to um, implement these these globally recognized benchmarks so that they can get into that the external markets and compete and be recognized. Correct. You will need increasingly. You're going to need this. So I spoke about um the ESG, so the government governance side. So this isn't even just standards. This is just about governance. So for example, from the the European uh, Union. For a company to deal with you or for you to deal with them, you're going to have to demonstrate compliance, governance compliance, right through your supply chain, okay, whatever that may be, before they're going to touch you with a 10-foot pole. You have to have this level of compliance, okay? And that means, and again, you, you have to do what it, you have to do yourself or your products and services have to do what it says on the tin and they have to be to a certain standard. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's critical and it's becoming more so. Okay. Um, Trevor, I'm going to let you answer your question now, please go ahead. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, Master Samri, Chairman. Um, Thanks, Jimmy, for your presentation, which leads us really very well into our um, the theme for the week of activities. I, I really enjoyed it. I have a couple, I have a question though. Mm -hmm. I take your point fully about the need for engineers to step up, but certainly with respect to the to bring in the problem solving skills to bear on on bigger issues. Mm -hmm. I, I actually think it is a major failing. I mean, the world has become very, very complicated. And we recognize that it takes special expertise, for example, in, in, um, in software design mm -hmm. to, to actually resolve those kinds of problems because it's so complex. Yeah. It takes special expertise and energy to resolve those problems. Mm -hmm. And I think the question I have for you, from your perspective in, in, in business, mm -hmm. 
Do you think that the policymakers and the politicians at the highest level recognize the need for specialized problem solving skills in addressing the extremely complex problems that we have been unable to solve in Barbados in the last couple of decades. And I could give you some examples. Sure. Yeah. Transportation, mm -hmm. national transportation management and policy. Mm -hmm. um, the whole question of education reform, mm -hmm. the question of housing, the question of um, the resolving, or and you mentioned this, the energy policy with the transformation to, to renewable energy. Mm -hmm. These are extremely complex challenges facing the country that have shown themselves to be not easily solved by trial, trial and error. Mm -hmm. So, But the question I want to ask you from your perspective, do you think that the policymakers and the politicians at the highest level understand that we have reached a stage now where specialized problem-solving expertise need to be brought to bear in addressing these problems? And, and, and if I could just give you a direct reason why I would ask you that question. You mm -hmm. yourself recently was appointed to this new commission on crime. Yes. Now, I suspect that you were elected to that as a business person. I'm not aware that there's another engineer or problem problem solving <laughs> specialist no. who was put on that council for that specific reason. Yeah. Isn't it time that we understand as a country that the world has become so complex and so complicated that this must be a leading skill if we ex actually expect to solve some of these problems? And to what extent are we there yet, would you say? Right. So thanks, Trevor. A indeed. Yes, it, it, in in my role, it's it's interesting. I sit there as as an engineer as well as in in business. And you're right. I mean, we were asked. It was two private sector agencies were asked to join that committee. So one is the BPSA and the other is the BCCI. So yeah, to have a seat at that table in that dual role is 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 interesting. But I do agree with you. I think a lot of the issues do require that approach to problem solving. I think engineers need to, as engineers, we need to advertise our skills better. It's not just technical. It's not just when I want to build a better building or better power generator or better PV plant or whatever. All those things are important, but it's the skills that go beyond that. Okay. Um, and I do agree with you. I think the technical input, we are seeing more of it, depending on what it is. We are seeing more of it, but... Now that you really highlight that here, I will certainly take that um, further in my discussions at various levels to say, you know, to really push home the point that you do need that technical input. And they, and but certainly some of them have been quite uh, interested in hearing, you know, about it. I mean, RE, of course, the, the is is the biggest one at the moment, um, and certainly in some of the discussions that that I was privy to, there was definitely technical input was required, whether local or overseas, and they did um, did ask for it and, and did uh, acquire it. And that's good. You're right. The world is a whole lot more complicated. And what we're finding is different pieces of legislation that may have been in place for 30 years, 50 years, 80 years, were all made in a different time and sometimes for a different purpose. And the alignment of, of policies and legislation and so on now is more critical than ever that we all work together and that they work together and enable people to work together in different, not just government, but government and private sector and labor and NGOs and so on to make sure that our society works more seamlessly than it does now. So yes, Trevor, there's a, there's a, a big role for that. And thankfully we are seeing more and a, a more recognition from the current policymakers that this is a, an issue and that it is definitely required and it's something that as an association uh, we can certainly um, expand on as well and, and let our voice be heard. All right, Trevor, any follow-up before I go to the next question? No, no, Vincent, I'm, I'm very fine with that answer, thanks. Okay, thank you. All right, um, next question is from engineer Jason Marshall. 
Are we as in tune as we need to be as to the potential impact of our work and problem solving skills on the financial performance of businesses and the economy? So, uh -huh. so that's a really good, good question. And it's a really important one. This is why in one of my slides, you will have seen understanding. We spoke about understanding what a business does. They may bring you in to do X or Y and say, we want it done this way. But if you have a, if you have a better understanding of the entire system, the entire ecosystem, or even sector, looking at it more broadly, even if they just want something relatively in your mind, simple, then, um, you can look at it and say, uh, you know, you're doing it this way, but you know, it would be more efficient if you did it that way. Or yes, this is less expensive, but it's going to cost you. It has a 20 year lifespan and whatever you think you're saving. No, it's a relatively inefficient equipment process, whatever the case may be, it's going to cost you a fortune down the line. So these are the sort of economic considerations and so on, which is engineers, it, it's really, really good for us to understand and to be able to have those discussions with senior people in, in companies to really explain what's going on and the impact of what they're asking for and what they're trying to do. You know, it's like what Trevor says, you know, dealing from policies and, and legislation and so on, you know, that comes right down and having that input from there makes our job a little easier because built into the very fabric of those um, uh, papers is the requirement of this technical expertise and financial expertise and so on. All the technical professionals brought together to give us the best outcome. Okay. Second part of Jason's question asks, how can BAP assist with better equipping our engineers to appreciate and meet the needs of the business community? So Jason, what I would say is that uh, for the last couple of years through these webinar series, we have tried to broaden the net in the topics and the areas that we have approached. Um, on this occasion, obviously, James sits in a unique position as both an engineer and a leader in the business sector. So we certainly, I mean, James and I have been talking about him coming on this um, program now for almost six months. So I'm happy that we were finally able to get it nailed down. But you know, when, when one of our own um, pushes their head above the parapet, by all means, we want to give them an opportunity to have a, a platform. But in addition to that, we did have some sessions last year. We had a whole month series actually last year where we focused on business because it's not only um, providing opportunities for our members to have the technical um, CPD, but also we wanted to provide the opportunity for our members who are in business, who have their own businesses, who are small business owners, to be exposed to some um, of those uh, topics or, or um, basically to be educated on how we should approach business, um, not only as engineers, but as a business person. So from that point of view, I want to say that we have been doing some of this through our CPDs. But certainly, if Jason, you think there's a wider or greater need in terms of facilitation as to something or probably a short course that we should be offering, um, by all means, reach out and let's have a conversation on it. So as we put our plans together for next year, something that we can consider probably running a short two evening session or something to get someone coming to, to speak to those members who are business owners and want to, as uh, James said, make, this, make themselves more aware of business in general. James, uh, what, yeah. what would you think about that? Absolutely. I'm here sitting thinking, you know, that oftentimes, so like from a chamber's point of view, uh, other associations, we have reciprocal memberships, basically. So sometimes you get people or companies who, or businesses that are members of both, for example. But then more broadly, we uh, share information. So like BHT is one of them, Hotel Association. So our... Um, any information that goes out from us also goes to them and they share it among their members. I don't see any reason I'd have to confirm this, but you know, why BAP couldn't have this or BA have linkages with business service organizations. And furthermore, I do think uh, a number of the uh, um, business service organizations also have various events throughout the year. And there's absolutely no reason why from an engineering point of view that we cannot put forward a topic that we reckon would be of interest to the business community 
and have it at, at one of these events, whether it be a luncheon or whatever the case may be, uh, we can put together presentations and certainly uh, present them to the business community. And, and these are ways to get more involved. And then when engineers attend these functions, some do already, you get to interact more than with more business people and so on and have these discussions. In other words, we're looking to, to prompt uh, thought, get people thinking, you know, in ways of which, you know, I, I really didn't think of it that way, or I only thought that this person was trying to sell me something or whatever the case would be. I didn't realize it was that involved and so many steps went into it and it had that level of impact. But I think it's being brought very much to people's, uh, to the forefront of people's minds now as they realize that our world is changing and changing radically and not just, and a lot of it is to do with human action on our environment. And it's it's got to be a bit worrying. Yeah. So I think now is a really, really good time to start showing, demonstrating, showcasing what we can do. Yeah, so I look forward to um, working yeah. with you on, on advancing that survey um, in yeah. the associations, on the association's behalf. Yes. Okay. Um, Andrew, I would mm -hmm. um, ask that you can unmute and answer your question. Sure. Um, hearing me? Yep. Yes, sir. Clear. Jimmy, thanks for the presentation. It was very um, thought provoking. As a, I mean, as an engineer, I just wondered, you know, what <laughs> what perspective you would take on the subject. Um, but it was very. I find it interesting, of course. Um, I want to. I want to ask you your thoughts on how do you see um, the advent or the rapid advent and development of digital. Uh, technology, the advancement of it, how does that, how do you think that's going to impact on the relevance of the engineer's role? Okay, so certain things, thanks Andrew, certain things, like as we've seen with AI already, there are certain things which AI at some point is probably going to be effectively be able to do. Okay, um, right now, AI stands at a point where you can, you know, put in, you know, you can ask it all sorts of questions, you can ask it to do things for you, but it doesn't guarantee that it's going to be correct. Okay, so you still need to have correct. as engineers, <laughs> right? You said correct, so it could be anything, and also to recognize that that's pulling information from somewhere else, and you know, when you get stuff second, third, fourth hand, you know, who knows if the original source is actually believable to begin with. So you still have to have that knowledge. What hopefully it will do is take away some of the more grueling tasks and, and run some of the things for you. But again, you got to be able to look at them. You have to be able to feed it the right information to get what you want back out of it. Um, where I see it becoming really interesting is kind of meta-analyses of data. So pulling suppose you had a like a, a large facility a large manufacturing water treatment whatever facility going on with thousands and thousands of, of sensors and data points being pulled in that at one point in time would have relied on operators to be managing all those different parts and that they had to talk to one another and all these sort of things whereas now the algorithms for example could pull all that data together Put it together and identify potential issues that not that we can't do it as humans but it may take longer to do so for example think about an aircraft next time you sit in an aircraft if you sit next to the wing and you watch the flight surfaces on the wings moving some is human input a lot of it especially when things get a little more technical it, the algorithms, the computers is, is, is what has taken over a lot of it. And they can see and react and do things much faster than we can. So I'm thinking like for trending and analysis and this type of thing, it could become really, really, really useful. Okay. And then as engineers, our 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 value comes in demonstrating, you know, not only usefulness of it, but you still need to know what you're collecting, where and why, and what when you put this and that and these three things and all these things together, what it really means in the whole grand scheme of things. So I, I can see that there as being like a really good 
uh, a really good use yeah, but, of this technology. But Go ahead. There, well, there, therein lies the challenges because mm -hmm. to make that judgment, that judgment call and assessing what is before you, yep. it requires yeah. a measure of experience. Correct. Um, exactly. That, 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 um, in my 40 years in consulting fraternity and running a consulting business for many of those years, one of the greatest challenges I had was with the advent of this technology. Every engineer had a program, you just click onto it, put in the numbers, and out comes the answer, and that's it. I found on many occasions when I reviewed that design mm -hmm. that the engineer got an answer, and he just took the computer as God, and it, there was no practicality. There were obvious errors in it because he didn't understand what he was doing. He was just relying on the computer program. And that, Absolutely. That bothers me. With, yeah. With, that is a great concern as, as as we get more advanced, you know, in the advancement of digital technology. There's, there's a software program for everything. You, do, you just plug in and get an answer. Bingo, let's go. I, I, I question the, you know, the ability of engineers to evaluate the authenticity of that output um, with limited experience. It is, it is an enormous challenge. No, absolutely. And I'm just going to take this to a very basic level. So consider, you know, when you were in school, um, certain, you had to do all your mathematics by your mind and work it out. It wasn't until much later on that you were allowed to use a calculator. Okay. But by then you had learned, it was imprinted in your mind that even when you use a calculator and you got an answer, you'd look at it and go like, hmm. No, 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 that can't be right. And honestly, I mean, I'm sure all of us have experienced this going through our various engineering programs, that the working was more important than the final answer because you needed to see you needed to see the steps. Now, anybody that's walked through any type of facility, whether, as I said, whether it's water treatment, manufacturing, a building or whatever, you cannot at this point in time replicate the your your senses when you go into that place and learn to know what's going on. I remember when I worked in the sugar industry, I would I could sit in the office and I knew when the factory was working fine. It had a certain note. Everything the, there was certain vibration and note, and you knew that it was generally okay. There were times when I knew that something was wrong even before somebody came and said, "Hey, we got an issue here." I was like, "I'm already out the door and heading across the yard because I know something is wrong." So. There's you cannot at this stage beat that level of experience. You have to be able to have it. How we explain that to say even the the current generation? I keep telling my kids. I say you still live in a physical world. You cannot hit reset on everything. You have to go out there and experience it. You have to see what it's like. And I think it would be remiss of us either as educators or mentors or whatever the case may be to. While we, yes, we see the benefit of using the software as a tool, it is at the moment a tool, okay? It, you know, I can have an engine in a car, but it doesn't drive the car, all right? There's other things that are required. Right now, humans drive the car, but of course, self-driving cars are becoming more prominent. But even with all of our technology, they're still not perfect, okay? So putting too much reliance on these things is not the answer. It is a tool. And we must have that real world physical experience out in the field and know what's going on before and use these items to augment or make what we do better. So the example I gave, for example, with the AI pulling all the information from a plant, I don't necessarily expect that that's going to shut down certain processes or whatever, but it's probably going to highlight to the operator this is what's going on on this line or these sensors or whatever we're seeing this example these are some possibilities that you need to check right so it's it's like an early warning system type of thing and it also can be used to example like the bim to make your building designs better um make the installation of everything including use of, and of, of the space not just for the services but for the people better so I, I, this is how I'm seeing it here, but certainly not, yeah. Andrew, not as a replacement for 
for that experience and, and, and knowledge, which takes us decades sometimes to build up and know, you know, inherently that, know. That's the challenge. If in the absence of that experience to evaluate what is before you, yeah. um, surely we could, you know, we could end up with a different, <laughs> with a less desirable solution. We absolutely, right? And we've seen it, some very high profile uh, incidents in recent years. When you look at them, you're just like, wait a minute, how did that happen? You know, like there, there, there was, you know, I know engineers and I'm put my hand up first, get accused of too much belt and braces, you know, but this is what we do. This is what we understand. We understand the, 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 the physical properties of materials. We understand electricity and mechanics. We understand um, structures and, and, you know, the impact of water and all of these other things, you know. So this is what we bring to the table. It's not just, you know, a, a, a I don't know, a valve sitting in front of you. There's a whole lot of things that go into us understanding what that is, why it is the way it is. Is it the right thing? Is it in the right place? All of this stuff. That's what that's what our profession is all about. That's what we bring to the yeah. table, you know. But you're right. We have to make sure in the education and mentorship that people, this current, the current generation of engineers, does not rely too heavily on these things and learns, it broadens their horizons, uh, without and and recognizes the software for what it is. But you know, with with each iteration, each year that we go. We do expect it to get better and better, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Chairman, I have one other question, if you permit me. Yeah, uh, go ahead, Andrew. I am constantly troubled by people in high office in Barbados speaking about sustainability, hmm? durability. We need to build our infrastructure with resilience, but yet. The single, to me, the single most important thing that's missing is the failure to adhere or even to recognize the need for code, building code, a standard that we should aspire to. Could you, could you help me understand? I can't, I can't get my brain around that. Andrew, <laughs> I am as lost as you are when it comes to building code. I've been working for over thirty years here, and I. You know, you see, there's a building code. Yes, there's a code. Why it is not required right through, especially now. Okay, I see for people that go to an architect or an engineer or both when they're building their building house, whatever the case may be, and get the advice. You can see some of the structures being built now. They should be pretty resilient. Okay, but for people that have their aunts, brothers, cousins, whatever, who with a hammer and a and a saw or something, you know, and they, you know, can put together something. Um, you know, I I that that is worrying, you know, we have the code. I mean, I was looking at a a a, a report on structures, I think it was from Dominica, and it was showing some of the ways the wooden rules were built built and why they failed. And some of them it looked like whoever built them figured that if it had in three nails, six would be better. And all it did was split up all the wood. So it weakened the entire structure, right? So the codes, the, the how these things are built, how they're put together is critical, right? I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to just, if you permit me, just go through this, this same FM Global report I was looking at. It says here, investors have squeezed by startup costs, the incentive uh, squeezed by startup costs incentivize them to cut corners and buy inexpensive lower quality equipment. One of the reports found that underperformance from equipment faults and related issues accounts for an estimated 4.6 billion US dollars in annual revenue loss for the solar power generation worldwide. Okay, and what they are calling for the insurance, this is the insurance industry calling for it now, is what they want to see is a fl what they call a flight to quality favoring less vulnerable renewable energy products and systems. Okay, so they're asking for better reliable, better made, uh, better designed um, facilities. They're also asking for industry certification. 
they want to make sure that all of the equipment, everything, that the, the, the point was raised before about the ISO standards and see all these other standards. So again, for for robust products and quality control and then all performance criteria so that it does what it says on the tin, you know, and it can survive, say a PV plant can survive 150 mile an hour storm without getting too banged up. Right, and also the adoption and enforcement of standards, right, for the designing and the manufacturing and all these installation, everything. This is what the insurance companies are calling for. Okay, I haven't heard them calling for it necessarily in Barbados, but I think as an association and an industry, we need to really be calling for this more. To say, you know, these these standards and codes and so on, they're not there to make somebody money or to make somebody's life difficult or anything. They're they have they mean. In terms of resiliency, if all of our houses were built and all of our buildings were built to the codes that we could have a storm, there would be damage, but we would bounce back rapidly. The problem that what is what is happening with these constant impacts of storms is sometimes a country hasn't even recovered from the last storm before the next one hits it. And the get that lash again. And this is where the building codes and so on. I, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir here, but this is where the, the enforcement of the codes and the establishment and re, re, reliance on these codes is so important. Well, how are we going to get that through the support of the government or the regulatory authorities? Um, that's the challenge. Yeah, that's the challenge. And I think part of it, and one of the arguments that I've heard is that that's only for rich people. Or that's only for this buddy or that buddy or whatever the case may be. And I disagree. There, there are ways, I'm not a structural engineer, but there have to be ways to make structures, for example, let's talk about houses, more hurricane resilient than they are at the moment. From the beginning. And it should be a requirement that somebody is looking over these things and making sure that they're done properly. Okay, so that they have the best chance of surviving something like that, uh, a, a storm. You know, um, I think the Americans and learned that the hard way in Florida when Hurricane Andrew hit there, I think in 1992, they had to change their entire building code because the, the devastation wrought by that storm was was shocking. And a lot of their uh, built infrastructure did not survive. Right. right. So they, they changed their whole code to make sure that they they have the best chance of survival. And it, it's it's absolutely unbelievable what some of these storms can do. Yep. Okay, well, that's, that's the end of my submission, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, thanks, Andrew. And James, I think you bring us nicely to the end there. And the last two questions I want to put to you this evening mm -hmm. for us to close off. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of what we can do, um, are you thinking, I mean, you've mentioned earlier the challenge of the in insurance industry um, ensuring renewable energy installations and projects. Mm -hmm. And we know that there's been a big push um, here in the region for such projects. So um, obviously our insurance industry here, and this is a, a, a fact that uh, something that came up on Friday and that session that Flo had, mm -hmm. um, the reinsurance industry, is it going to then be a case that we will be forced to externally if we want to guarantee reinsurance that we need to have a building code? Is it the insurance industry who will drive it if it is that the government doesn't want to hear? Because certainly... Yep. BAP has been beating the drum for the longest mm -hmm. time to deaf ears. So yep. is it the case that we need to then join with the insurance company to bang the drum a little louder yes. for the authorities to hear? Absolutely. Because the last thing you want, is, especially in a small and developing state, is to be uninsurable. Okay? That, I mean, that would be absolutely devastating. We see what's happened here with the, our fishing fleet from barrel the impact that was even a direct hit, and 240 something boats were damaged, and only a handful of them are back in the water, and an even smaller handful was actually insured. Okay, so you see what happens just as a microcosm of what happens. Not that they were uninsurable, they just were not insured. But if you have projects and so on that you've spent millions and millions of dollars on, an insurance company says, Well, you need to prove to me that this is built to this standard, to this code. Uh, with these types of materials and so on, before we're actually going to touch you, um, yeah, they're they're gonna they're gonna drive it, and um, you know, and and rightly so. You can't ask people to ensure, yeah, just do my plant here, you know, and and uh, 
about a 70 mile an hour wind, the whole thing disappears into the nearest camp piece. You know, yes, there's going to be damage, but it needs to be resilient. So you don't expect that, you know, so that you can bounce back as quickly as possible. I don't think you can anticipate zero damage. But the idea is that it is going to have the best chance of survival and the best, easiest chance of repair. And and uh, so I think that's going to be critical. Yeah, I think you're going to see more and more of it. All right. The last question for you this evening, James. You did mention in your, your discussion earlier the importance of mentorship uh, by those who are senior um, mm -hmm. in terms of the engineering or the technical areas, architects, etc. cetera. Um, what approach from your point of view do we as technical persons need to take in Barbados in a more aggressive way in mentoring our younger engineers and helping them to bring them through? I mean, Andrew just mentioned some of the challenges he's had where persons perhaps um, get a little lazy and use the technology, but not necessarily check back things through thoroughly. Yeah. Um, so in terms of mentorship, what, what advice do you want to offer there? I think... Having some kind of matchmaking platform. So in our own day-to-day -day business, if you happen to work with more engineers and you have them within your company, you can provide that on the fly as you go. I think it would be a good idea to have some, uh, it's kind of like a mentorship community where say the BAP could help pair um, more senior people with more junior people it's going to take an ask on both sides. So in other words, you can say, well, um, engineer Joe Bloggs, he or she is an expert at this. And you know what? People who are interested in getting into that field, you may want to connect them, you know, for a certain type of contact if they don't have that uh, availability, say, in their own uh, workplace. I think that would be helpful. But Andrew is absolutely right. If somebody comes along and relies on something too much, and Andrews is long retired, for example, and this person is there and they really are going to struggle. I don't know. You know, it means that the, the quality of the work then goes down and then how can they then train the next generation? So I think having a more formal mentorship um, and there, there are various models for that, which I think could be adopted. I don't think we have to reinvent the wheel, but it would also provide that greater contact uh, between members and so on and then give us an opportunity to transfer some of that knowledge and experience right thanks james yeah. and when you said andrew is retired just to clarify that i andrew, said don you said, tired. It's not that I he's said, retired i said i said if andrew is retired oh if, andrew is if, not if, going okay. to retire <laughs> all right um, i i james i'm going to ask your indulgence i did see bruce but i is. see bruce so yes, I give yes. Bruce that opportunity to ask before and bruce your question will be the last one for tonight so bruce gentlemen thank you um, I was wondering if uh, it's also your opinion that uh, maybe one of the weaknesses for adopting new technologies and, and digital transformation lies in weakness of engineers and technical professionals to, to justify or show financial feasibility for, for these you know, new technologies and, and digital transformations. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the IDB report. So the reason the IDB did this report is they recognize that in the Caribbean, there is a dearth of digital skills. So their program that they're working on currently is one to identify the skills gaps to uh, in all sectors, not just in business, in government, um, uh, wherever, across all different types of, of sectors and figure out where they need to be because they have accelerated programs that they're looking to build capacity of digital skills within the Caribbean. And they do have uh, they do have programs that they've done, uh, certainly in Dominican Republic. They're looking to do it in Barbados and more broadly. So right now they're at the assessment stage. Um, so there is that, yeah, once they build the capacity, that's going to help. But in the interim, unless somebody here has that specific competency, they may rely on people coming in from overseas if that competency is not in Barbados at this point in time. And hopefully there will be opportunities for knowledge transfer. 
Um, but it is it is on people's radar, so they are looking for it. So there are opportunities. So anybody that's in the computer engineering field and so on, um, probably is well aware of this already. Um, but certainly it also opens up avenues for junior people coming along now, people now starting or partway through their engineering degree, you know, seeing where the industry is going, they may be able to jump on and, and take advantage of that uh, right now. Is that, is Bruce? that, uh, Bruce, is that? Um, well, yeah, partly, um, but mm -hmm. in my experience, like you, let's say you have a solution to a problem or, mm -hmm. or you're looking for new technologies for your business where mm -hmm. you work as an engineer. And you put this forward to your board or your, your management or whatnot. And, uh, right. you know, the cost is high. It's the first thing you look yes. at. Yes, yes. And the, the young engineer doesn't have the skills to say, well, look, you know, you spend this. This is your return. This yep. is how much you pay in finances. And yes. this is how much money you save at the end of 20 years, 30 years, yes. 40 years. Correct. So, <clears throat> so engineering economic analysis, um, certainly if it's not taught in schools, it should be. I know certainly when I did engineering, that was a, a whole course. Um, and I think there's something that, that that's actually, uh, Vincent, an idea for another um, technical session on economic analyses. I also think in that situation, a junior engineer really has to delve into, yes, you're right, the business case, because accountants may look at it and say, ah, that's too much money. I don't see a good return. You have to have a way to present it. And... In that case, it may also be helpful if the person does have a mentor or even can pull on a mentor to come and help present these cases. Uh, I think it will be very powerful. But this also brings in your communication skills, your presentation skills, um, and so on, beyond what we are taught, just technical skills. So these are, these are whole other areas of training, which I would certainly encourage anybody in engineering to get involved with. Um, you know, whatever it is that you're presenting or selling, uh, I think it would it, it's it's really important. Um, but yeah, when you're presenting new technologies and their importance, uh, it can be challenging sometimes, especially when the the sticker price is is high, and sometimes not all of the variables are known. You can only do certain projections if it goes this way or that way, and. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's helpful in those scenarios to break things down into smaller chunks that are maybe easier to swallow and let people get a taste of it. And then when they want more, it's a lot easier then to sell them on the improved or increased uh, scope once they've had a taste rather than a wholesale change sometimes. And that's just what I found um, yeah, from my experience. And I, I give an example, like uh, energy efficiency. I remember having discussions with a, a large company about energy efficiency. And they were like, man, this sounds like a lot of money. And they were, how, how, you know, what am I going to do? And we started just like that, you know, just with very, very small things. Prove it. And most of the time, the, 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 the remit was prove it. I want you to prove it to me that this actually does it. So... I think that could be one of the approaches to deal with with something like this. Does it really work? Does it have? Uh, can you demonstrate the actual value? And even if it's on a small scale, you may find that the that that's all you need to start the the ball rolling. Yeah, agreed, agreed. Um, and I think right now the Ministry of Energy is looking at. Uh, starting an energy service company mm -hmm. for that same challenge that you mentioned there where people are saying you know prove it before they put their finance into the basket uh, but i think it's a good idea as well yeah i mean we we, we have to be able to prove it right and it is it, it, there's no other way i mean you can't just say yes it's going to do this or i expect or whatever it nothing works like actually seeing it there in the flesh <laughs> You know, this is how it does. This is what we did. This is what it showed. These were the issues. And this is what it means for you. And this is why you should adopt this technology process, uh, whatever. Yeah. Thanks, Bruce, for that yeah. question. Yeah. Thank you.
Well, James, thank you. thanks so much for coming on with us tonight. Um, I know you have an extra busy schedule these days, so really thank you for <laughs> accommodating us on what I thought was a very important topic, the responsibility of the technical professional to the corporate landscape of Barbados. And um, I mean, certainly we do have persons right here within this call, yourself, um, Trevor, um, Andrew, I mean, who we can look upon and see as persons who have not only just flown the flag and the engineering capacity, but have gone on to flow to fly that that um intellect in so many other areas and making an impact and a contribution to our country. So I want to thank you for coming on and sharing with us this evening. Um I just want to quickly before we do go, um remind everybody of the week of activities that we do have coming up. So Kenton, if you can bring up, thank you. So just a reminder, guys, church service is on um, Sunday, 29th of September, which is um this coming Sunday, and this is going to be at St. George Parish Church. We then have our webinar next week, um, Tuesday, which is going to be delivered by um, engineering fellow Andrew Hutchinson. And Andrew is going to take us down memory lane a little bit and speak about the development of the Barbados Association of Professional Engineers. But then we're going to have that tour that we spoke about in the members' line. Um, which is going to be at the Barbados Light and Powers um, Clean en Energy Bridge up in St. Lucie. So that's next week at 3 p.m. on the Wednesday. And then it's going to be a member's line directly after that on the West Coast. And then we have our big awards dinner where we will be recognizing um, five fellows this year, Engineering Project of the Year. And um, we really hope that you will come out to what's going to be a stellar evening we are blessed to have the president in attendance at this event. So we're really looking forward to you guys supporting the event and coming out, buying the tickets, and really let's make a good night of it. Let's um, show up and show off, um, and celebrate our peers and celebrate our profession. So we're looking forward to seeing you next Saturday um, at our uh, 60th anniversary awards and um, ceremony and dinner. And this is going to be at the Wyndham Grand Resort, San Luis Castle. Please do reach out to Stacy in the office pertaining to tickets. Um, there are tickets available. If you are so inclined to purchase a, a table, maybe you or your colleagues or friends or engineering or other business associates you may want to treat, uh, we invite you to do so. Just reach out to um, Stacy. Uh, she's more than willing to assist in these matters. So thank you all. We look forward to seeing you next week in the Tuesday webinar with Andrew. And we have a webinar coming up also, a more technical-based webinar coming up later in the month of October, uh, which is going to be delivered by Asphalt Producers. So um, thank you all, and we do wish you a good night. Thank you again, James. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Good night, everyone. Good night.